In section 5.1 of the Zill book, we discuss linear models appropriate for second order differential equations. And we're going to start off by looking at an application of Hooke's law for springs. And what I've drawn here is an illustration of a mounted spring here, where the spring has a length L. And then you attach a mass to the spring, which of course stretches the spring a little bit. And the distance it stretches the spring from its initial position is this additional displacement S. So what happens is the system is in equilibrium at this point where the spring of length L has been displaced uh, a distance S because of the attachment to the mass. And then you can model the movement of that mass if you were to pull it or it was going to bounce or anything by this displacement uh, parameter X, all right? So what we know from Hooke's law is that the spring itself exerts a force F opposing the direction of elongation. In other words, as you pull the spring, either the mass does or you or an external force moves the mass, the spring is exhibiting a force against that. And it is proportional to the amount of that elongation, how much it's being stretched. And so what Hooke's law says is that opposing force, again, has a representation like this, that it's just the product of some spring constant K times that displacement S. So this is a constant known as the spring constant. And the strength of the spring will determine what that constant is in terms of how much force it's going to exert against it, in terms of it's a weak spring or a very strong spring in terms of its ability to resist. We're going to look at a couple of different representations of motion for the spring. The first one, we'll say part A, is the case of what we call free, undamped motion. the spring. And here's the scenario that you take your mass M, attach it to the spring, okay, and then it stretches the spring let's say by an amount S abbreviate that as S, and this is going to be represented as the equilibrium position. At which the weight of that mass, we'll say W, is balanced by the restoring force, again, that's exhibited by the spring, which, which we know from Hooke's law. And we'll call it K times S. So that just means at equilibrium, the spring's not moving, it's holding on to the mass, and you, you've got a stable system. So how do we represent that equilibrium? It could be modeled in the following way. Well, you've got the weight, which we know, representation of weight according to Newton's second law would be the mass times gravitational pull. Again, this is from Newton's second law. That has to be balanced by the restoring force by the spring, which we just said according to Hooke's law, so that has to be K times S. Or another way of writing that is the difference between mg minus ks has to be equal to zero. Now typically, mass here can be measured in a couple of ways. Um, we may use the term slugs. It could be in kilograms, or it could even be in grams. Right? So it just depends, and we'll illustrate that with an example coming up. <clears throat> so if we assume no external forces acting on the system, hence the idea of free undamped motion. So again, the, the nature of the term free here, in terms of undamped motion, means no external forces 
acting on our system, our spring system. Okay. So therefore, again, going back to looking at Newton's law, we can represent it this way. We'll represent that as the mass times acceleration. That's the second derivative of that displacement. It's another way of writing the acceleration. It'll have to be equal to minus k times s plus x plus the weight. You've got the weight acting. You've got the opposing force of the spring as x moves. As moves. And you can simplify this equation right here. Um, be minus k times x. How is that true? Because we know that mg minus ks has to be equal to zero. We just had that up here. If you simplify this term, you're going to get a minus ks plus mg. That's going to be equal to zero. You're going to be left with my, uh, minus kx. The reason this is negative again, right here, it needs to be opposite to the direction of motion. So again, Newton's second law, the force acting on that mass has to be described in terms of the weight plus the opposing force exhibited by the spring. There is a convention, just in terms of how to interpret the signs of the displacement, is that displacements, in other words, that's when the mass moves down, let's say, displacements below the equilibrium position which we'll assume, let's assume its market is x equals zero, those displacements are taken as positive. So that just means if you're at equilibrium, we consider that x equals zero, and if it stretches down this way, that would be like x equals two or something like that. So the positive displacement means you're going down, all right, from the equilibrium position. So let's go back to our second order equation here, look at it a little bit more carefully in terms of how we can frame a mathematical model for this system. All right. So what we've got here is we've got m times the second derivative of the displacement, which is again, another name for the acceleration of the mass, simplifies to the spring constant, negative times the spring constant times the displacement x, Pull things over to one side, divide through by m, you would get second derivative of the displacement plus the ratio k over m times x equals zero, which is certainly a second order differential equation. And we could look at um, defining initial value problem then for our system the following way. We're going to change a little bit of notation here write it as the second derivative. I'm going to make a variable change. Call this omega squared x equals zero, where omega is k over m. You'll see why we want to write it in this form later. And the initial condition is that the initial displacement would be some value x zero. And because it's a second order e, O to E, we need another initial condition at that initial time zero, and that'll be the initial velocity, and that'll be another value x1. This type of system has a very special name. This is called simple harmonic motion. Again, it's a free system, and it's undamped. pull the mass down and just watch the spring bounce back and forth, back and forth until it settles down again. Now if we go to the auxiliary equation associated with the second order problem, we could write down the auxiliary equation because we know that's important for coming up the solutions to these homogeneous second order problems. We could write it in the form m squared plus omega squared equals zero. 
because we've chosen the constant in front of the x term to be written as a square. Doing that allows us to quickly see that the roots are, first root would be omega times i, and the second root would be minus omega times i. Right? So the general solution then to this second order homogeneous differential equation would be that the displacement equation, where that mass is in time, is given of the form some constant C1 times cosine omega t plus another constant C2 sine times omega t. That would be our model for describing where the mass is at any time. You'd then use your initial conditions to figure out what C1 and C2 had to be. A couple other things just in terms of terminology. Sometimes uh, for such systems you talk about the period of the spring system that would be represented as capital T, that would be 2 pi over that omega parameter. Interpreting that, that is just the time in seconds for the mass, let's say, um, to execute one cycle of motion. That means going down and then coming back up and then coming back down again. So doing one cycle of motion. The frequency of the system then could be represented by a little f, which is usually just 1 over capital T, which in this case will be omega divided by 2 pi. That'll be your number of cycles completed per second. So in one second time, how many times did the mass come back to its position again? Okay. Omega itself has a special name. It's usually referred to as the circular frequency. of the spring system. So we'll do an example of applying our model of free undamped motion using Hooke's law. All right? So let's look at an example. In our example, let's suppose our mass weighs, again it's important to know what it weighs, it weighs two pounds, and let's say it stretches the spring six inches. Now we may need to pay attention to units here because what gravitational constant and so forth may be given in feet and so forth, so we may need to change our constants. Let's suppose we know at time t equals zero, the mass is released. At a point, this tells us where it was released from the equilibrium position. Let's say at a point eight inches below important, that'll representation of a positive value below the equilibrium point. I'm going to say EP with an upward velocity means it's being pushed of four thirds feet per second. And our goal, or the question at hand, is what is the equation of motion? So, <laughs> we'll use our model that we've already built earlier using that second order differential equation. We just need to come up with those constants. All right? So let's recall a couple of things. Uh, keep in mind the units here. We've got weight in pounds, two pounds. We have stretching a spring six inches, and it was released eight inches below the equilibrium point. All right? So let's first of all go back and realize that gravitational constant g, typically with a nice number is 32, but it's 32 feet per second squared or 
if you were in meters, it would be 9.8 meters per second squared, right? But we're going to stay in the feet, um, inches uh, measurement system. So keep in mind, mass could be written as the weight divided by G, right? Newton's second law there. In this case, you'll have two pounds divided by 32 feet per second squared, and that'll give you 1 over 16. But this unit, pounds divided by feet per second squared, has a name. This is slugs. So that's 1 16th slug, right? So that tells us what our mass is. Don't confuse weight with mass. That's the mass, all right? Weight takes into account the gravitational constant. Now let's go to Hooke's Law, because we've got to figure out the force that the spring's going to exert against that. Go back to Hooke's Law. All right. Again, the force exerted against it is, some, is proportional to the displacement S. In this case, we just figured out that it was given to us that it weighs 2 pounds. So you've got 2 pounds being countered by a constant K now times the displacement. Well, it displaces 6 inches. We need to stay in feet. Our units, based on the uh, getting the mass and so forth, is going to be in feet. So this will be half a foot. Right? So what we'll get is that K then has to be 4 pounds per foot. You want to keep the distant measures in the same unit. So again, this is 1 half feet, which is the same as 6 inches. Okay. So now you've figured out K, you certainly know what M is, and now you can write down your differential equation. Right. So let's do that now. So what we've got, remember, is that M, your mass, times the second derivative, has to be minus K times X. For this particular problem, that becomes 1 over 16 slugs times the second derivative must be minus 4 times x, because we figured out what the spring constant is. And clean this up a little bit, you could get the, you could rewrite this as the second derivative of the displacement plus 64x equals 0. Initial condition, if you go back to the problem, it was pulled 8 inches below. In feet, that would be 2 thirds. So that would be two-thirds feet. And the upward velocity means we would represent it as minus four-thirds feet per second. Okay? If it was a downward velocity, that would be a positive value. All right? So we do have to watch our units. Then if you look at um, the auxiliary equation to get the solution, um, well, before we do that, we also know that Omega squared in this case is 64, just looking at the form that we have there. So that means omega is equal to 8, square root. So going back to our lecture notes, we know that the solution has to have the form, of the displacement has to form C1 cosine omega t. We now know omega is 8 plus C2 times sine 8t. Again, how did we know that? Go back to the notes, and you'll see we already wrote out the explicit form for the solution, and we're just plugging those values in. Right. Again, we now know what omega is. Right. Using your initial conditions, you can show that C1 is going to have to be equal to 2 thirds, and that C2 is going to have to be equal to minus 1 sixth. So, the equation of motion that we needed, or the displacement equation, sometimes it's another term. Displacement equation would be given by x of t is 2 thirds cosine 8t minus 1 sixth sine of 8t. This would give you the position of that mass after you start it pulled it down 8 inches below equilibrium, pushed, pushed with the velocity so that it was upward with negative, uh, about 4 thirds feet per second. This would tell you where the mass is at any time t. Okay. 